Well, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Karen Rose. I run Monty's House Wildlife Rehab in Shaftesbury. I have been licensed since uh, October of 2018. But the number one question people generally ask me is, why? Why and how did you get into this? And the answer, the, the answer starts back in 2017. I work from home. I have a full-time job in mortgage operations, which isn't half as interesting as wildlife rehab. Uh, but I have a full-time job, and I was in my, I live in an old farmhouse, and I was in my pantry trying to figure out what I was going to have for lunch. And my pantry abuts my mudroom. And like any old house, there's cracks and crevices and areas that things can get up into. Uh, like any house in Vermont, we get critters that come in. And I'm hearing this gnawing up where the, the pantry roof abuts the mudroom roof. And I thought to myself, here we go. I've got some kind of critter up in my mudroom roof. So I grabbed a have a heart trap, and I set my heart have a heart trap. And for days, I caught nothing. And for weeks, I caught nothing. And then finally, about two and a half weeks in, I had walked out into the mudroom. I was leaving my house, and I heard some rustling in the have a heart trap. And I caught my culprit, and it was a red squirrel. And I thought, fabulous. I've taken care of my problem. So I did what you're not supposed to do. I took the squirrel, and I rehomed her to another zip code. Didn't know it was a her at the time, but it was a her. Not really supposed to do that. So I brought her to another nice wooded zip code and released her. Off she went. And four days later, I have an indoor cat. And the door to the mudroom from my kitchen is solid on the bottom. And Fenway, that's the cat's name. We're a Red Sox family. Fenway is standing on the mat, looking out, staring at the mudroom. Can't see anything, but is staring out at the mudroom. And so I'm thinking, well, that's really weird behavior. He never does that. And so I looked out, and I saw two, three, it could have been 100 of these little things kind of prancing around. And my heart sunk. I said, this is, I, caught, I caught my culprit, but I rehomed your mother. And so I quickly went to my friend, the Google. And I said, what am I supposed to do with these? Well, they were red squirrels, because I knew the mama was a red. So I gathered them up, did everything I shouldn't have done, bare hands, just picking them up like they were kittens or something. And I put them, I had a, a little chicken coop that I have, I have chickens as well. I have a little chicken coop that I had used when I hatched out chickens. So I thought, OK, you're going to be safe in here. So I put them in there. I had three of them. And I'm standing in the mudroom again, and I'm still hearing and hearing. And I go back to the Google, and Google's telling me, well, they can have up to five, six. So I thought, oh my gosh. So I ended up with five. I couldn't tell them apart, but I named them the Jiffies. They were all named the Jiffies. And so I ended up, they were, they were at a point where they were almost ready to leave you know, at, at their natural age. And so they all went away. They, off they went. They would come back. They would eat sunflower seed out of my hand. I did all the wrong things. I would do the things I would tell other people, like, don't do that. They're wild animals. But I did all the wrong things. And so they released. It's June of 2017, and off I go on my, my way of life. Literally a year later, in May of 2018, again, I have a chicken coop that gets locked up like Fort Knox. It is up off the ground. It's underpinned on stilts. Unless somebody has opposable thumbs, they are not getting into the chicken coop. And it has a, it has a we called it the skywalk, because the chicken coop is separated from the pen so the chickens could go out. And the skywalk gets locked up, and everything gets locked up. And I go out in the morning, and I open the sliding door to the skywalk, out tumble all the chickens. And I go into my chicken coop, and there's not a chicken in the chicken coop. So and I walk in, and there's this little gray squirrel underneath the chicken feeder, happily eating chicken food. And I'm thinking, how the heck did you get in here? How are the chickens not freaking out that there's something else in here? And so anyways, there was episode number two. I named her Monty. It was the name. Sometimes names just come to me. They pop into my head. So I named her Monty. And she was, again, on the cusp of almost being on her own. But again, into the auxiliary chicken coop she goes. And she kind of rehabbed in there. And I asked my dad, I'm going to introduce him. I, I have several folks on my license that are, under, that are licensed assistants that can have contact with the wildlife in my care. My dad is one of them. He's sitting in the back row there. Hi, Dad. <laughs> um, he helps out a lot, a lot. And this was the first venture. I said to him, I said, 
you know, I'd like to have, I've seen squirrel boxes, and my dad is a fabulous woodworker. I said, can you build her a squirrel box that she can have inside her little chicken coop? And then when she goes out into the wild, we'll hang it up on the tree, and she'll have a house where she can kind of call home as she transitions to the wild. So he built Monty's house. And Monty did very well, and she would come and go. She started to leave, and she would come back. And one afternoon, I don't know why, she came in, she, well, I know why she came back inside, but she, I went to check on her at night and she had passed away, very suddenly. With no, she seemed perfectly fine in the morning, she was out, she was in and out throughout the day, and she passed away. And so it was at that point, so this is probably late May of 2018, it was at that point where I, and I had looked up online, and again, I did what I would ex tell anyone else not to do, I then discovered, hey, it was illegal to possess wildlife without a permit in the state of Vermont. But that's how most of us rehabbers kind of get started. You have these incidents. And so anyways, after that, I decided, you know what, I'm going to pursue. I have the time. I have the resources. I think I have the know-how. I have a desire. And I'm going to pursue what it takes to get licensed with the state of Vermont. So I did. And so I made my application in June of 2018 went through some, you know, it's, I, I volunteer, I'm a volunteer, but I report, if you will, my permit is issued through the Department of Fish and Wildlife through the state of Vermont. So you do need a license. So there was some red tape with that, but they issued me my license in um, October of 2018. And I didn't have any calls at the end of 2018. I didn't have any calls at the beginning. My first intake came, my first official intake came in May of 2019, May 19th, and I haven't had an empty house since. With my permit, I am licensed for non-rabies vector mammals, which means that I am not rabies vaccinated myself, so I cannot possess any animal that the state of Vermont has deemed to be a rabies character, or statistically has been determined to be a rabies character, a carrier and a character. Um, in Vermont, that leaves me out of skunk, raccoon, fox, and bats. So I cannot intake any of them. And even though there are about 20 of us, 19 or 20 of us uh, rehabbers in Vermont, a rehabber is not a rehabber is not a rehabber. We all have different licenses. So mine are for non-rabies vector mammals. There is another gentleman who is rabies uh, vector licensed, but all he intakes is bats. There are some people who all they want to take in is waterfowl or birds of prey and raptors. So there's all different licenses for wildlife in Vermont. Um, I generally take in the smaller mammals. So my, in my wheelhouse are squirrels, cottontail rabbits, opossums that I have a bunch of, woodchucks, chipmunks, and I've had a single porcupine, which if anybody follows on Facebook or social media knows that she is like a fan. Well, she was a few weeks. She got released in this past June, and she was a fan favorite. Um, I am licensed for, but I do not intake uh, larger mammals, such as bobcat or coyote. I just am not set up for them. They need a much larger, they need much larger enclosures um, before they can really get released. And they, they feed on, they eat in the natural environment, the little critters that I release. So as I'm fond of saying, I don't like to put the dinner and the diner together. <laughs> I don't like to do that. <laughs> and then I don't intake other animals that I just am not set up for either, such as beaver and river otter, because I don't have, uh, well, I do have a water source. There's a natural spring on my property way in the back but I don't think my neighbors would be too impressed that if I let a, you know, a beaver go out there and practice their damn building skills and mess up at somebody's drinking water, they wouldn't like that. Um, so I don't intake those. So those are generally the species that I do intake. Currently in my care, I have some gray squirrels. I just released uh, four gray squirrels the other day along with two cottontail rabbits. They got released back to the wild, so I currently have Three gray squirrels right now. I have two red squirrels. I have one cottontail rabbit. They go out, and one came in last night, injured, cat caught. Um, and then I have 14, 15 opossums currently right now. Yes, and I am gearing up for now. This is a quiet period for me right now. As crazy as that sounds, it's a little bit quiet but I'm gearing up for the second half of squirrel season. So we'll talk about some of the animals that I'm licensed to possess, squirrels. There are four species of squirrel in Vermont. Does anybody know what they are? Gray and red. 
Black, that's very interesting. Yes, black squirrels are, they are, they are a species, but a black squirrel is really a gray squirrel. They are part of the same genus, yes. Basically what black squirrels, they're, they're what black squirrels are called are melanistic eastern, I mean melanistic eastern gray squirrels. So they're part of the gray squirrel family. And basically all that means is that in their development, they ha their genetics produce an excess of pigmentation. Just like someone has blonde hair, someone has brown hair. So the pigmentation of your hair color, your eye color, your skin color is all different even from the same family. And then they can go the other way. There's the absence of pigmentation. You don't see very many albinos here. I have seen them on social media. Um, they have white squirrels, a lot of white squirrels over in the UK. But they are all part of the eastern gray squirrel family. So it's just a, an excess or a lack of um, pigmentation that causes their color. And the, I had uh, the last season in April, I had four squirrels that came in from the same litter gray mother because they had seen the mother in this tree in downtown Bennington and I had four squirrels two black and two gray all from the same family all from the same litter so it can happen in separate in uh, singular litter as well so we have black I mean excuse me we have black we have gray and we have red anybody know the other two flying, flying. there's two flyers there's e there's northern and southern flying squirrels and we generally will see around here southern flying squirrels now lots of people will say, I don't ever see them. I don't ever, I never know, I didn't know that they were around. Well, they are around, but you have to go out. They are nocturnal. Whereas gray and red, or black squirrels or white squirrels, they're what they call diurnal, meaning they're like us. They get up in the morning, they do their business during the day, and then they go to sleep at night. You won't see squirrels if, in your yards if you went out. They're tucking themselves in probably right about, right about now, you know, when it gets to be about dusk. Whereas Flying squirrels will come out at night. And I didn't know, I rehabbed one. I had one that came in over Labor Day of last year and I released her. I had my first very flying squirrel, so you'll have to, you'll get a kick out of it. I had to name her Rocky from, you know, Moose and, Moose and Squirrel, you know, the old uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon. And so Rocky came in over um, Memorial Day weekend and she was released in September. And the interesting thing as well with flying squirrels, unlike grays and reds that are, they live in a litter, like all day, and, but then they all go off on their own. They're solitary creatures when they're living on their own. Flying squirrels colonize, so they can be in colonies of up to 30 squirrels. Yes, it's, so my, it was not ideal that I only had one. They found one in a bathtub in Dorset, and they heard commotion in the attic, and I said, well, you probably have more, but only the one came down from the attic. And so I raised Rocky and then released her, and I thought, well, hopefully, she'll f I didn't know if I had any. And then when I had seen them later on in the season, they stayed throughout the winter. They're out there now. Every night I see them. But they, if you go out at night and you hear, and I recognize the sound that I, then, that I now know to be flying squirrels, it sounds like a bird chirping, very high-pitched bird chirping, like a squeak, 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 like that almost at night, when birds should not be out at night. But if you hear that particular pitch and they will start to chatter at each other from the trees, you know you have flying squirrels. And they're magical to me, I find them magical. They don't actually fly, they have extra uh, folds of skin from, well, for, from our armpits to our ankles essentially. And they, I, I support them with peanuts in the evenings. I put out some peanuts in the evenings and so to support the whole crew, that I, the one that I release, but it'll support the rest of the gang. And you will see them, they'll come down and take a peanut and they go to almost the highest point in the tree and they launch themselves and they just, they more like float, if you will, from tree to tree. But they can float a long way because I've been taking video of right here and they will be coming from, they'll come in over my head and the next nearest tree is pretty far away. So they can fly or they can glide a, a pretty good distance. But so that's why a lot of folks, when they say, I didn't know we had flying squirrels in Vermont, you have to go out, so you'll have to go out at night and listen and you'll hear them. And if you leave out some peanuts for them, they'll be your new best friend. You'll have a whole bunch of them. I know definitely that I've seen on the tree, I call it the feeder tree where I support the squirrels that I release. On the feeder tree, I've seen five or six of them together, but they can live in colonies of much larger than that. So those do they need a base? Do they need something to stand on? They don't really ever, I have never seen them, Steve, ever hit the ground. 
I have never seen them on the ground. They go from tree to tree to tree. And so they'll make their homes in, I, they, I know for a fact over the winter, they were going in one of the squirrel boxes that I have hanging out and they, were, they weren't living in there because I would check, because I have an endoscope, I would go up and you know, stick it in there and check to see who's in there. I do, I have an endoscope like a camera, you know, a little camera with a, a little, you know, it's an endoscope, yes. But I go up and check. And they weren't in there, but they would eat the nuts in there. So they would eat in there, but they were not living in there. And they, they only need a small, you know, hole to get into. But her house, Rocky's house is still up. Dad helped me hang that last um, September. So her house is up there. I don't know if they live in there. Again, you don't see them at night. And when, they're, when I do see them, they're feeding. So they're going from tree to tree to tree. And, um, but yes, I've never, ever seen them on the ground. So I don't really know if they scatter along the ground or I, I don't think so. I think they just, they stay up in the trees and they go from one to the next. But squirrels will have two litters per season. This is where I was saying this is my slow period. So they generally have their first litter. They could be born in late February, early March. So my phone calls for orphans generally start coming um, early April through May. And then they give me a break and then the second half of the season will be happening soon. They will generally have their second litter in June into July, and I, my calls will generally start happening August through September. So those are, the, those are squirrel species. Um, cottontail rabbits that I can take in, my goodness, that season never ends. They can have, for adults who know what I'm talking about, the phrase breeding like rabbits, it's absolutely true. Mama rabbit can have a litter every 30 to 45 days from March through the latest I have ever gotten them in, I was stunned, um, was early October. Usually it's through September, but I had baby intakes early October. They are very, very fragile outside of, um, the, away from the mother in, in, any, in captivity. Rehab is captivity. They have about a 10% survival rate. I've had a very tough season this season with cottontail rabbits. I've gotten in litters of six and eight and five and the survive, I, the 10% is really presenting itself with me. I've success from, from little babies. The, the, the smaller they are, the younger they are when they come in to me, the, the tougher it is, the, the less success I have with rehabbing them to release. Their mother's milk produces an antibody that has not been able to be really commercially replicated well. Uh, we have formula for them, but they are, their GI tract is very, very sensitive, so any little misstep in any kind of environmental bacteria that gets in there, stress, their body produces a chemical that when they get stressed, they can be doing fine. I can come down one morning, they're doing fine, and by the afternoon, they're gone. And they're, it's just, the first time I ever got cottontails, I was so petrified of them in 2019, and I brought my first litter to my vet. That's another piece of getting licensed uh, with the state of Vermont. You have to have a partnering vet that will sign on with you, that agrees to treat, to prescribe medication, and to euthanize as needed. And so I brought these little bunnies into my vet. My vet is uh, West Mountain Animal Hospital in Bennington, and I work with Dr. Linda Morris. And uh, she walked through the door, so she, I call them and I tell them what I have, so she's somewhat prepared, and she walked through the door and she said, you know they call these things little heartbreakers. And at the first time I thought, well, I'm gonna give it the old college, and I did, I had, I had five, one of them passed away immediately, there was a second one that went a few days later, but I was able to, re, re, you know, to rehab and release three of them, so I thought I was doing pretty good with that litter. And the statistics are still in my favor. I, I save more than I, than I lose, but this year, the beginning of it has been very tough. But, um, so cottontails will come in all throughout the season. I haven't had any little ones. I've been getting a whole bunch of cat caught, dog caught, that kind of thing, injured. Um, so those are those species. Uh, opossums that I have currently. Um, opossums will have can have two to three litters a year. Generally, they have two, some only have one. They can have, a, an opossum is, well, one of their cool features is they're North America's only marsupial. Do we know what that means, everybody? Do you know what that means? What does that mean? Mm hmm Mm 
<laughs> mom's helping out here. She said they save their energy a lot by eating and mom helped you out. They have their babies in a pouch. So kangaroos have them and so do opossums. And so in a mother, a female opossum pouch, there are 13 nipples. But a possum baby, but possums, the gestation period for opossums is about 13 to 15 days. That's it. The babies are born the size of a jelly bean or a honey bee. And they have to make it from the birth canal up to the pouch, which on an opossum is probably, you know, three or four inches. And then first come, first serve, they have to get onto a nipple. And unlike other mammals, like squirrels or raccoons or fox, opossums don't suckle. So the younger they come in, the more difficult it is as well because they essentially swallow the mother's nipple and they just hang on there. They just hang out until such time that they're old enough where, and that generally happens at about 30 to 45 days where their eyes start to open and the pouch starts to get full and that's when you'll see them they will still feed in the pouch, but they move from the pouch to the back. All the cute pictures you see with the mama opossum with the babies on the back. Um, but the mother opossum can give birth to 20, 22 babies, but it is first come, first serve. Um, and so the younger they come in, we as rehabbers, with all my other animals, squirrels or bunnies, I have very small, they call them wildlife nipples, and they get fed formula. And the opossums get fed formula too, but you tube feed them, which is a little bit more precarious because it's basically intubating them. You go put the tube all the way down into their stomach and you, with a syringe, you just feed them that way. But the smaller they are, the thinner the skin, there's a lot of you know, dangers in puncturing and bruising. And so um, a lot of rehabbers won't take very, very small opossums because again, their survival rate is really low. Um, I've had them come in, their eyes were still closed, but about 35 grams, which are still pretty tiny. But the crew I have now, the, usually when opossums come into me, it's because, for a couple of reasons. Mom has gotten killed, and kind of either, you know, people hit them with their vehicle, and people will stop, and what they, what's called pouch picking, they will look for babies, and they will pluck the babies out of the pouch and call a rehabber. Um, or, you know, they, an animal has gotten to them, and I've had that with one of the instances of a crew that I have with me. Or, the bigger they get, they're not quite ready to be on their own yet, but the bigger they get and they hang on mom's back, mom does not grab their young like a raccoon mom picks up their young with a, like a cat would. Or, same thing with a squirrel, will pick up their babies and bring them from point A to point B. Opossum mamas don't do that. So, if the opossum falls off the back, it's like the bus is leaving. You ever miss the bus? <laughs> you gotta run to catch it? You gotta run to catch that bus. And so um, a lot of times if the little baby's not paying attention and they get left behind, I've had a couple of calls with that of singleton. So opossums either come in in litters of six, I've had litters of 12 come in, so it, it definitely increases the numbers that I have in my rehab room, or they come in, I've had several singles come in this year. Um, and so I have, what I've gone over, I've gone over squirrels, we've gone over bunnies, opossums. I've had woodchucks come in before. I've had one just an injured woodchuck. Um, again, a lot of that is from mamas that get hit on the road or folks who don't want them on their property who do what I did with the red squirrel. They eliminate mama and then they have babies that come out because they burrow. Woodchucks are burrowing animals. So sometimes you don't know that there are babies until mom gets moved and the babies come out looking, hey, where'd mom go? Uh, same thing with chipmunks. I've had several chipmunks. I overwintered two chipmunks last year. Um, one came in injured, one came in as a baby, and the same kind of thing. You don't, if mama gets, inj if mama gets, gets killed some on the road or caught by a cat or a dog, unfortunately, all those babies are underground. So unless the babies make it out and come up looking for help, you don't, you don't necessarily know that they're, that they're there. Um, so that's woodchucks and chipmunks. The porcupine, I've had one porcupine, again, like I said, for folks who follow on social media, Indy, she came in um, last July 4th, hence her name. Uh, she was short for independence. And porcupines have, they can have more, but statistically they'll have one baby per year. A porcupet is the name of the uh, E-T-T-E, -E, porcupet, um, and the name of the baby porcupines. And porcupine, I got Indy in at about, she was about a week old, so she was probably about this big. Porcupines are born with all their quills and their quills are soft at birth, and they harden within probably about an hour after birth. 
and they tag along with mom till probably they're about um, 16 weeks old. I overwintered Indy last year because at 16 weeks she was probably around mid-November and I had other, it becomes like a juggling act or like a shell game for me at the end of the season of who goes out and I have release pens, so I'll get into that in a minute, who is out in the release pen and I figured she's not going to be able to get out there, uh, you know, I'm not going to release, I want to set somebody up for success, that's what to me, that's what rehab is about, I want to rehab you to a point where I'm going to set you up for success in the wild and I was not going to send her off uh, as a new little porcupine in late November, early December. So she overwintered with me. Um, interesting things about porcupines, I can tell you. Um, they do not shoot their quills. Lots of people think that they shoot their quills. They do not shoot their quills at all. Um, the way that usually it's dogs that end up with quills in the muzzles, you, how they, the dog gets quills in the muzzle is that, and if anybody wants to see this and you're on social media, if you go back to the videos on Monty's House Wildlife Rehab page and you can look at the videos, there are some cool videos of Indy doing her porcupine thing. And they, what they'll end up doing is if they see a predator coming or they deem something to be a threat, they're gonna turn around quickly so they're gonna show you their back because that's really where all their, their quills will start, sure, quills start around her eyes, but then they go all up her head, all down her back, down her arms, but most of them are across the back and down through the tail. And so they're gonna turn around and they're gonna back up at you really quickly. So maybe that's where it gives the impression, people get the impression that they can shoot their quills, but they're really not doing that. So they back up quickly at you and then they're gonna spin and they will spin and spin and they will flick their tail very quickly. So it's really herky-jerky kind of movements that end up people, and I got, not quilled, but you know, even in just trying to handle her, she makes a quick movement, and anything that it touches, the, there are so many little barbs at the end of that point, and I do have some of her quills, if you wanna take a look at them when we're all done. Um, I do have some of her quills on display, so you can see them. Um, but that's how dogs or humans or cats, whoever runs into, any other wildlife runs into a porcupine, that's how you get the quills in them. And they are very, very dangerous to have in you because, or, or in any animal, because if they're not removed quickly, they, the points are so sharp, sharper than a hypodermic needle, they can move through the muscle mass. And so I've heard stories of people who have lost domestic pets because they bring them to a vet and the vet thinks that they've gotten them all out and they haven't, and just with movement through the muscle mass, they can puncture a vital organ. So another good reason to keep pets on leashes. Um, but at adulthood, porcupines maintain about 30,000 quills. So when you see these, they have 30,000 of them throughout their whole body. But the entire underbelly, so in these, from her chin all the way down her tummy to her legs, there's no quills whatsoever. So she and I had a really good relationship. So I could literally, I don't recommend anybody doing it, but I could, with a bare hand, go underneath her and just pick her up. And she wouldn't, we didn't have a problem with that. She didn't have a problem with that. But they don't have any quills on their underside. So they become, um, they are the prey, the best, the, the most known prey, a predator, excuse me, of the porcupine is the fisher cat. And the fisher cat has figured out how to, to get at a porcupine, you need to get at the belly. So the fisher cat has figured out how to turn the porcupine or get them when they're up in the tree such that they can render them defenseless by getting at the, the spot that doesn't have any quills on them. So that's the, the species that I do intake. Um, any questions so far with any of that? Do we have any? Yes. So porcupines don't have quills on their stomach? What do they have? They have fur. The question was, um, do, if porcupines don't have quills on their stomach, what do they have? They have fur. It's very coarse. I don't know how to describe it. It's not like cat or dog. It's very, very coarse. Kind of like a soft Brillo pad, I guess I would describe it. Like a softer kind of scrubby brush. It's not, it's not gonna tear you up, but it's not like, you know, and, and she had fur throughout her whole, over her whole body. The quills are kind of embedded into the fur. So they're covered in fur, but the quills are coming out of the fur and the same kind of fur on her, um, on her belly. So she's, she was, I wouldn't describe them as soft. They're not soft, but. The quill, now that's an interesting, that's a really great question because different species of porcupine, the question from Steve was how long are the quills? And I have seen, I'm sure we've all seen videos on, on YouTube or social media, for example, African porcupines 
have super long quills, hollow. You can hear them coming. They clang, 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 clang when they're walking. Indy's quills, I would say, at her longest are probably, I would say, three inches. And some of them got even, you know, to be a slightly longer. But hers, the North American, Indy was a North American porcupine. Um, her quills were probably, I would say, three, three and a half inches at the longest. But it doesn't take many of them. And it's, they, it hurts. They hurt <laughs> when they get stuck. Yes, sir. When they uh, launch their quills or their quills are gone to another animal, yes. they regrow. Yes, they do. The question was, if the quills get embedded into another animal, do the quills regrow? Absolutely. And um, I liken it to um, ladies who pluck their eyebrows like that. So you can, you are pulling out, you know, you get your hair pulled out like a hair follicle, they will absolutely grow back. And so much like most animals, they don't want, like the skunk doesn't really want to spray you because then if they empty that scent sac, they've rendered themselves defenseless until it fills back up. Same thing with porcupines. They don't grow back super quickly. It takes some time for the quills to grow back. Um, and so when they lose them, it rent, it, they're not going to lose all of them, but it does render them with fewer defenses should they come upon another predator. Yes. So um, let's move on to, if we don't have any more, we're all set. Any questions on the live stream page or we're good? OK. Um, folks on the live stream, if you want to ask a question, you just holler it out and Paige will read it to me. Um, we'll move on to what you can do if you find injured or orphan wildlife in your travels, either in your yard or if you're hiking or wherever you might be. Um, this is one of the things that we are, I have several of these different sizes. They don't have to be plastic. You can do them with a cardboard box. This is one of the things we're going to, I gave you raffle tickets. Someone's going to go home with this particular one tonight. But this is a, what I have and I call a wildlife prep kit. And I have several of these made up. Um, it's a good thing to have if you think you just want to be prepared. The main ingredients in here, there's not many of them, is you want to have some kind of vessel. Like I said, it can be a box, it can be a cat carrier, it can be anything that's going to have some ventilation. Especially if you're looking at, with babies, that you don't need anything big. Um, for injured, you may want to have something a little bit larger. I have larger cardboard boxes in my car. You can pack the cardboard boxes down so they don't take up much room but you can keep it in your garage, in your vehicle, in your shed, wherever you think it might be handy so you don't have to go looking for it. What you're gonna wanna have in there also is, this is just fleece. You don't want anything with, I mean, in a pinch, could you use a towel? You could, I don't usually recommend it because uh, little fingernails get caught in the terry cloth loops. So anything, fleece, uh, an old t-shirt, jersey material, so that's ingredient number one. You basically wanna keep, the number one rule is you want to keep the, the youngster, if it's a, a baby, warm, or if it's even injured, you want to keep it warm. Second ingredient, let me put this down here, is going to be gloves. So you can get these at the Dollar Tree, you can get them at Ocean State Job Lot, you can get them at any store. In here, I'm going to give you, someone's going home with, there's two sets of large, extra large, and two sets of small, because you really don't want to, they don't, most of the, the critters that I rehab, you're not going to, there's no diseases that they actually, that they're going to carry that you're gonna get, but sometimes they have fleas, a lot of them will have fleas, and they may have other little creepy crawlies, and they may be bleeding, so best to protect yourself. Um, the other thing, like I said, number one rule is to, when you, when you collect them, is to keep them warm. So hot hands are always a good bet. And you can get these, again, Ocean State Job Lot, any sporting goods store, online at Amazon, hot hands. And what you'll want to do is once you activate these, you're going to tuck them between the layers of the fleece. You don't want the, the heat to have direct contact with the wildlife, but you want to keep them warm. And then the last thing is here's the list. Um, Fish and Wildlife does a good job with this. They, where there's a list of all of us that are licensed. So there's the map of the state, here's the, the, all the towns are in gray, the, there's rehabbers in, and then here's all of our listings on the other pages with our legends, what we're listed, what we're licensed for, the listing, um, if there's any specific or particular you know, field of interest, somebody really likes bobcats, somebody really likes porcupines, somebody really likes you know, waterfowl, um, and our locations and our phone numbers. And so 
I have this printed, one's in my office, one's in the living room, one's in the kitchen, because if I get called, I sit down here by myself in southwestern Vermont, so I get, and I encourage them, I don't have a problem with it, I get all the calls for everything. So if somebody finds, somebody had found a bat, in their house, they gave me a call. Somebody has a question about a duck in their chimney, sometimes I get that call. And so if I can't help you, I wanna direct you to the, to the person that can assist you with it. So this is why this is printed all over my house. But I think if it's in your little wildlife prep kit, one, you don't have to go to the Google, or you don't have to go, you know, obviously you have my, you'll have my card, so you can certainly call me, but if you knew that you needed to go somewhere else, you can have this list. It's, uh, it's not on mine, it's on the Department of Fish and Wildlife. If you put in the Google, if you put in Google, uh, find a wildlife rehabber or Vermont wildlife rehabbers, you'll get a link to that. I'm just wondering if I click on your Facebook page, you can do every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. There it is, I should probably pin it somewhere because I have posted it before, so that would be, that's a good idea. I should pin that somewhere where you can find it. Yes, yep. Yes, there are, yes. And social media is good for that. People find one thing or another and they go to you know, your community forum uh, pages and people will end up recommending you know, where to go. Um, and so the next thing I always, when people call me and they'll say, I found a thus and such, and then we'll talk about the circumstances, how they found it. And sometimes it's too late at night and it's not going to get to me till the next day or to a re another rehabber to the next day. Um, and People always feel, and I know everybody means well, people feel compelled to give it something to eat and something to drink. And I always say to people, if you just broke your leg, would you want a Big Mac? <laughs> and that's the last thing you're thinking of. So I always tell people, warm, warm, warm is the number one thing. Make sure they're warm and don't, the big don't is, don't give the wildlife anything to eat or drink unless you've been instructed by a rehabber that is that is specific to that species sometimes if it can't make it till the next day and you have to keep it overnight I might say okay offer it a, a little bit of apple or offer it some you know do you have some Pedialyte is a you know to hydrate do you have some of that but unless you're instructed to, to give it anything don't give it anything just keep it warm and we'd ra I'd rather deal with that than there's people that mean well, that have kept wildlife for a day or two, and if you don't hold them properly when they're little, you, they can aspirate them, which basically means instead of the water or whatever they were trying to give them going down their esophagus into their stomach, it goes down their windpipe into their lungs. And then we, are into, we have a bigger problem. We can end up with a little one who now is cold and hungry and misses mom, and now we have pneumonia. So it's another step to try to, to right the ship. Um, and the other thing, never, ever, ever, ever to do, if, and, and again, people mean well, wildlife should never have any kind of cow milk product, ever, ever. Um, people mean well and they give them cow milk because they have it in their refrigerator. I've had people give squirrels half and half. I, yes, they think that they're doing well. And can you imagine what comes out the other end? With that, it's terrible, and it's not, it's not fun. It's very painful for the squirrel. Their bodies don't, are not d uh, designed to process those proteins that well, so there are specific formulas that we have for squirrels, for raccoons, for fox, for all different kinds of species that are specific to them that we feed them. Never, ever, ever cow's milk, ever. So there's that. Um, and then coexisting with wildlife on your property. I know, I'm sure I've been one. I know there's other people that have been one that have had bears on their property come around. And so bears are big lately. Then there's some people that just don't want certain species kicking around. Sometimes people don't like woodchucks uh, digging under their garden shed or in their garden or under their garden shed. Some people. Um, and I think through, there's ways that we can coexist with wildlife. Some of it is, is the responsibility is our own, specifically with bears. Um, we need to be responsible about where we put our garbage um, and our bird feeders. And we have to understand that, you know, they were here in the woods. We're in their woods, essentially. Um, but we have to be responsible with, with some of that on our own, and even though we might like to feed the birds and put our bird feeders out, we have to understand that it's probably not the smartest idea because we don't want the bears to get familiar. What ends up happening is the bears get too familiar with 
our location and locale, and then if there's an incident with an interaction between a human or a domestic pet, then there's a whole other issue where the bear will have to be disposed of, unfortunately. And we don't want that to happen. Um, and then again, I think we can compost properly and keep the bears out of our composting. And you know, you just want to make sure that they don't come too close to your. It's fine. We they're around. We know that they're around. We just don't want them so super close to our to our living quarters. Other animals, obviously. Uh, I mean, I live with animals. The animals are in my house. My house has a rehab room. There, it's right. I work like I said. I work from home, but I have a rehab room that's right next to my office. That's all that happens in that room. I don't have animals in any other, they're not in my kitchen, they're not in my living room, they're not up in my bedroom, they're just in the rehab room. Um, I do have a screen porch where it's never been used as a screen porch, it's always been had some kind of chicken or what have you. Indy lived out there for the winter. Um, it's fully, you know, it's not, there's no heat source, but it's a great spot for uh, Indy overwintered there. I had two red squirrels that were out in a flight cage out there, so it's a fabulous spot for overwintering animals. Um, but I do have, they, they live in my house and then they live out on the screen porch. I do have this weird thing where I say, I've invited these ones into my house. And so I completely understand when folks have critters in their homes that they have not invited, whether they be squirrels that are breeding in their attic or a duck in your chimney, or, you know, people have had raccoons that, that breed in their attic, um, Obviously, those things will, you'll want to remove them because it's, those become a safety hazard. And uh, for that, I do have, there's an exclusionist that I work with. He's out of Bennington. And certainly, if you ever ran into that situation, I can certainly pass along his name. And he will humanely and safely remove them. Even with little, little babies, he will remove them. And if you can't find a home, they will come to me. He's brought me some squirrels. He's brought me some opossums. Um, but other things that are outside, like your woodchuck that's getting into your garden or living under your shed, sometimes during the height of the season, you know, when everybody's growing their garden and they want their garden to be left alone and the woodchuck is out there and it's eating the, your, fruit, your veggies, sometimes the, the, the advice that I give is can you, can you tolerate it for just a little longer because the mom likely has babies and then they're going to end up moving and going along their way. And, so some of it is, and, and I got a call from somebody who had fox, discovered there was a fox den in their, on their property somewhere, and they were concerned about their dogs being outside. And again, it's one of those things where it's like the fox den had been established for years and years. They were new to there. Um, they had built this home, and all of a sudden now there's a conflict. Uh, but a lot of it is, I think, for at least from my my point of perspective is we can be tolerant with some of it and be responsible whether we need to be responsible pet owners and or put up and you know fish and wildlife is big with electric fences if that's in somebody's um you know book of options you can put up electric fences so it absolutely delineates a perimeter for wildlife to stay out or to be pet owners that you take your your animals out on leashes so that there won't be any conflict with wildlife as they as they come along yes Absolutely. Who's that from? Who asked that? Uh, Tanya. Tanya, great question. Um, no decon, no poisons. Um, again, we're in Vermont. We know we get mice in our houses, and I've gotten them. And, you know, some people, you can buy humane traps where you can trap them, and you can relocate them other places and make them somebody else's problem. Um, <laughs> but if you don't want them, I understand that. I mean, rodents are rodents are rodents. Uh, mice are rodents. Squirrels are rodents. Porcupines are rodents. Uh, the smaller rodents people don't want in their homes, and I get it. And if, if you don't want them in your homes, and if you don't want to use a live trap and have to collect them and bring them somewhere, snap traps should be your go-to. Uh, because what ends up happening, that was an excellent question, Tanya, when you, po when you put out poison and you think, okay, I got rid of my problem, my problem is gone, the mice are outside because allegedly the poison makes the mice th thirsty and they go outside and look for a drink and they die. Well, what ends up happening is all of those animals that prey on mice, so owls or fox or opossums who consume that mouse have now consumed the poison and it does cause a secondary problem. So you'll end up with um, owls that, you know, that perish because of that or need to go to rehabbers 
And usually the counterbalance for a lot of species, at least for mammals, for poison is vitamin K. But it's a long process, and you don't know how much they've ingested or how long it's been. They can bounce back from it, but it's an absolutely, it solves one problem for us humans, but it creates another problem for other wildlife going on from there. Do you, do you work on legislative issues? Because it seems to me that's a very fertile ground for legislation that just outlaws the use of those poisons. I, I think that's an abomination. Yeah, I, I do not, I have a full plate oh, with the, yeah. <laughs> I have a full plate. I do not work on legislation. If somebody asked me for my opinion on it, I would certainly, you know, uh, give my opinion. If there was someone else who wanted to write a bill and, and get the opinion of uh, someone in my position, but no, I've not. I've not worked on any legislation for any of those things. But yes, um, the, but I, I know exactly what you're talking because there are other ways to there. I think the way folks look at it, and I'm just surmising, um, the poison is the easy, you put out the whatever it is, the, the blocks, the pellets, the whatever, you put it out and you don't think, you're done with it, right? Whereas snap traps, live traps, there's some involvement. You have, you have to go collect your dead specimen at that point and you have to dispose of it. Whereas with the poisons, you put it out and you're done. And, but you're really not because it's created a secondary problem for wildlife down the line. Yes, ma'am. I do not do bats. The question was, do I do bats? I do not do bats. Um, bats are a rabies vector species. I am not rabies vaccinated. Um, and the only person I really know, and he's kind of the bat dude, uh, Barry Genslinger is up in Milton, Vermont, and he is, he is a rabies vector rehabber, but all he intakes is bats. So. Barry gets the bat questions and the bat species. He's far away. He's about three and a, three some odd hours away. I can tell you a funny st bat story if you want to hear it. Okay, and this is about me. This is the rehabber bat story. This was in February, and I, in my free time, my spare moments, um, I sew. And so I was going upstairs one Sunday morning to sew. And I live in an old farmhouse, and there's no heat up there. So there's there's dual air conditioning heating units. So I, th I said, you know what? Before I go up and sew, I'm finishing up my coffee. I'm going to go turn on the heat upstairs to warm it up, and then I'll go upstairs. Well, I go upstairs, and I have my coffee in one hand, and I'm coming up the stairs, and I come around the corner, and something flies over my head. And in that moment, I'm in the nursery, I'm in the garden section of Home Depot where they have all the birds flying around, and I was like, how the heck did a bird get in my house? And it went over to the, to the window at the top of the stairs, and then flew back at me, and I said, that's no bird, that's a bat. And I'm thinking again, how did the bat get in my house? And so it went into, I cornered it in one of the bedrooms, and again, with any kind of, and I should say this, I'm gonna get off tangent, and then I'll come back to my story. If anybody comes upon any uh, species that is rabies vector, meaning even if they're super cute, little raccoons are super cute, and baby skunks, and they're all really cute, and everybody wants to, you know, if you happen to find you want to pick them up, don't ever pick them up without gloves. Because if you have to call a rabies um, rehabber, that's the first question they're going to ask you. You say, I found a baby raccoon, and they're going to say, did you handle it? You say, yep, I put it in a box. And they're going to say, did you wear gloves? And if the answer is no, I didn't wear gloves. That unfortunate little baby will have to be tested for rabies to protect you because you touched it. And the only way you can test that is that they would have to be put down. So you always want to wear gloves. It can be gardening gloves. It can be big dishwashing latex gloves, but you always want to wear gloves. So I got my gloves, and these are the gloves that I wear. Besides having the little latex ones, if anybody wants to go crazy and buy these, these are for women. These are. Um, Welding gloves, but these are the gloves that I wear because I get bit, yeah, I get bit a lot, or often enough, especially with the adults. So I put on my gloves, and I go and I get my net. That's another thing that I, you know, after a full season of being a rehabber, I was like, I probably need a net because critters get loose in the rehab room that has a door, but anyways. So I get my net, and I collect the bat, and then I have the bat, and I brought it downstairs, and I put it in one of the cages that... I have my squirrels in. And I'm like, aha, there you are. And the bars are like this big, wide. They're like an inch and a quarter wide in there. And I thought, I got you now. And I turned around, 
and there's the bat flying around the rehab room. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, now I gotta collect you again. So I collect the bat, and I put it in a little critter keeper that I put like the little babies in, plastic one. And I call my buddy Barry, and I said, hi, it's your friendly rehabber from down in the southwest corner here. I found a bat flying around my upstairs of my house. And he said, aha. And I'm thinking, I said, how did it get in? It's the middle of February, it's early February. And he said, well, how old's your house? And I said, I, it's coming up to be about 100 years old, somewhere in that range there. And he said, I'm sure you've had bats in your house for probably five years after it was built. He said, you've got an old house. And I said, okay. And so I took a picture of it and I sent him the pictures and he said, you have, you have a big brown bat. Big brown bat, it was like this, you know, you know, they're cute, but big brown bat, it was like this. And I said, all right, so what do I do? I know because bats can't go out, they don't survive the winter, they can't be out in the cold. So I said, what do I do? And he said, well, you could bring it up to me, you can drive three and a half hours up to me, seven hours round trip for you, and I know where this is going now. And he said, or, I said, you're gonna tell me to put it back in my house, aren't you? And he said, yes. <laughs> and I said, I, I, and so I, he gave me the instructions. He said, take your little critter keeper, put it on its side. There's like a little window in the top. He said, open the window so you can put a little bit of water, go up in your attic. And he said, let it go. And I was like, okay. And I hung up the phone. I'm thinking, even in the rehabber mind of mine, I'm thinking, this is insane. Like, when would I take like any other animal, a squirrel, and just let it go? In my, you want to go back up in the attic? Go right ahead. But that's what I did. I let that bat go right back up into my attic. And I would go up there at other times with my headlamp and stare. And I'm looking in the eaves and I'm looking at, I couldn't find a bat to save my life. And he said, go up there in the springtime, but I still haven't found them yet. They must, they're around my property. I, I posted a video the other evening of them flying around my property, but um, I've had bats, bats in my belfry, I guess. <laughs> I've had bats in my belfry. But that's where if, a lot of people find, and he said they, and I learned a lot from chatting with, Bear, chatting with Barry about the bats. Uh, they follow a heat source. So I have a drop stair to my attic and it's sealed off. The former owners built this funky seal, it kind of seals it off. It's like a, an igloo top out of that thick foam insulation, but nothing really seals really well. There's still these gaps. And he said, they'll follow a heat source. And he said, so they will find, they can get in. He said to me, those little brown bats or big brown bats can get in. They're like mice. They can squeeze through a little spot as tiny as your pinky. And he said, you have, you have pipes that vent out to the, you know, in your bathroom, a waste pipe out to the ceiling, out the roof. And I said, yeah. And he said, they can come in that way. He said, they find all kinds of ways to get into the house. And once they find a, their spot in, they will hang out there year after year after year. And he said, do you hear, and I live in Vermont, he said, do you hear scratching in your walls or up in the attic sometimes? And I said, yeah, I know I have mice. And he said, the difference between mice and uh, bats he said, if you hear something every night scurrying around, you have a mouse. He said, if you hear something and then you don't hear something for a couple of weeks, it's separated by a couple of weeks, he said, you likely have bats because bats, they don't go into true hibernation. They will sleep and then they will wake up and they will do a lap or, lap or two around and get the lactic acid going in their muscles and then they go back to sleep. But, so, but I learned a ton from Barry just in that time. So I released some wildlife back into my own house. The crazy part. Yes, ma'am. You have another question from Thomas. And the question is, what is the number one reason why you have intakes? Is it the best animal like Oh, that's a great question, too. My intakes come from the question, uh, did you all hear Paige's question? No. You know, the question was, what is the number one reason that I have intakes, the how I get animals? Is it from domestic pets, cats, and dogs? And there are two reasons that I get intakes. There's the injured and then there's the orphaned. Um, the injured largely come from the road. They can be victims of the road. A lot of times those don't survive, uh, whether it's squirrels or rabbits. We all see them on the side of the road, unfortunately, opossums. Sometimes they just get clocked, just the, you know, they get clipped just enough where you end up with a, with a head injury. Um, and I've had those. Um, other injuries, specifically rabbits succumb to it all the time, are outdoor, and I'm probably gonna say some unpopular opinions right now, I'm just gonna preface you. Um, uh, outdoor cats and unleashed dogs <clears throat> are the number one reason for, specifically with cottontails, not with rabbits, not so much 
some squirrels get, get cat or dog caught. Um, and unfortunately, cat and dog, for, specifically for cottontails, uh, cat and dog saliva is just deadly. They don't, I, I successfully released one that I released uh, yesterday or whenever it was, last week, um, Saturday. She, this cottontail rabbit came in, dog caught, all kinds of open wounds. Um, they need antibiotics administered almost immediately for them to survive. Cat saliva is worse than dog saliva. I was chatting with my vet about it several weeks ago when she rattled off a whole bunch of long Latin names of disgusting saliva that's in a cat's mouth. I mean, if, if I bit you, you'd, you'd get an infection. But for cat and dog, it's much worse. Um, and the minute they get punctured, it's kind of like a mosquito bite. The minute you get punctured, that poison is already in there. Um, so domestic pets act, are, are definitely a cause of a lot of the injury, the road and domestic pets. And then the orphans, again, as a result of the road. Um, some wildlife, you know, uh, we understand the circle of life, so squirrel mommy's lives get lost because the circle of life, there's a predator that came and found squirrel mom in the wrong place um, at that time. So those are the injured and orphaned is generally what I take in. Okay. Interesting question. So the question was about getting licensed for wildlife rehab. Are there any stipulations for it? Is there acre, acreage minimums, um, house minimums? There really aren't. <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife has changed their uh, specs as of February of this year. When I got licensed in 2018, there were really no um, there were really no parameters or guidelines, if you will. There's a, you, you read the uh, National Association of Wildlife Rehabber uh, Standards, but that encompasses you know, uh, species that are native to Florida or native to Arizona. So it's across the country. It's not just, it's not just state or locale, the Northeast. Um, so when I got licensed, you have an application and an application fee. You have two personal references why they thought I might be good with animals. Um, you have a vet attestation and certification that they will partner with you. And then you have an exam that's administered by a warden that came to my house. And there's a weird kind of, not push and pull, but it's, it's a dichotomy. It's illegal for me to possess wildlife without a permit. So when they came for my inspection, I can't have any wildlife in my possession. I, shouldn't have any cages because I don't have any wildlife. So I walked him into my house and I said, here's my rehab room. And it was just a room. <laughs> and I said, here's where I'm going to keep the critters inside. And then we walked outside. I have just under two acres. Um, and we walked outside. And I was like, there's where I think I'm going to build my release pens. And he was like, OK. And I said, and then I have all this other area that I can you know, uh, build. But uh, they haven't changed those standards. Now they've changed the standards where they want an apprenticeship program, which I think is, is practical and, and helpful. They want, you want to have some hands-on experience being able to treat a wound or feed an orphan or what have you. Um, but there are no stipulations, at least in Vermont, for any of that. There's no minimum acreage. I don't know of any town that prohibits it. Your neighbors, I, I mean, depending on how close, I, I know who my neighbors are, but I can't see them standing in my house. So um, I, I don't think that there's, unless you had a neighbor that really didn't want the wild animals. I, I release most of mine. People ask that question as well. I release most of mine at my house. My dad does have, I've released some cottontail rabbits up um, at his property, uh, but I release most of mine at my house. There's acres and acres and acres behind me that they can, they can go to New York unencumbered if they want to through the woods there. And so basically the process, um, I will kind of wrap this up because I know I'm a little bit late. The process for release, they spend some time in the rehab room inside with me at a certain point when they're, when they're able, depending on their species at an age. Most of the squirrels head out to the release pen generally at 10 to 12 weeks. And they'll spend three weeks out in the release pen, which basically is open. Uh, it has a roof on it, but it's, you know, they're caged in. But they can get to the sights, the smells, the sounds of the, the big wild world. And then 
It's not as, you know, it's not as dramatic and beautiful as, you know, an owl or an eagle release where they take off and you're like, wow, the squirrels are kind of like, what, what? The doors open? What do we do? What should we do? And so that's the, you know, but that's, you open the doors and you let them go. And the same thing with the nocturnal monkeys, the critters like the opossums, you open the door at eight o'clock at night and you're like, well, whenever you're ready, good luck. Whenever, you know, you wake up, good luck. But, um, so that's, so they start inside, they end up outside, and then they just take off and they, they find their own home. And some of them stick around. One of my black squirrels, we were talking about the black squirrels. I had a black squirrel that came in, like I said, in April of last year. She got released in July. She stuck around the entire winter. She had babies this spring. I saw her, she was a nursing mama. She, she's, she's living somewhere locally. I see Onyx every single day. She hangs around, she's on the property. But some of them, they scatter wherever they go. Um, and then the other question is people think that because I raise them and the reason why they don't allow, none of you can come and visit them. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Nobody, that's why I post a lot of pictures on social media. Part of my permit is there's no contact with anyone other than the folks on my license. Like my father can have contact with them um, and there's one other woman that's on my license. Um, but they want to reduce the amount of imprinting on humans and domestic pets. You heard me say I do, I have a cat. I have a domestic uh, cat. And Fenway stays, he has no desire to go, he doesn't, he's not allowed in the rehab room, but he doesn't even go to the rehab room door, he, it doesn't bother him, he has no interest in it. Um, but they want to reduce the amount of imprinting. They don't want the wildlife to think that humans are good, and they don't want the wildlife to think that domestic cats and dogs are good, and to approach them, um, to approach us in any way. Um, so that's the other question I get. People say, oh, they're going to come back. They're going to want to hang out with you. They're going to want to, they've gotten used to eating all this good food at your fruits and vegetables and all this good stuff at your house, and they're going to want to stay, and they don't. Everybody thought that Indy would, Indy spent 11 months with me, and everybody, I haven't seen Indy since June 4th. She went off, and she did her porcupine, she's doing her porcupine thing, and even with the squirrels, some of them hang around. It's easier to tell with the black squirrel, because some of the grays, it's tougher, but there's a time when they, they, we call it wilding up. They wild up, those instincts kick in. And I don't spend a lot of time with them. Like I clean their cages and I feed them in the morning. Uh, there's more handling when they're younger, when you're formula feeding them several times a day. But as they grow up, like right now, they get fed in the morning and then the opossums get fed at night. I feed and clean their cages in the morning. I don't do anything else during the day. And then when I get home this evening, it's lather, rinse, repeat. I'll do the same thing again. Um, in the evening, and then I'm done. Yeah, yes? The issue of imprinting. Yes. By definition, imprinting is physical contact with the animal or just an association? Um, that's a great question. The question was imprinting, is it physical contact or just association with the animal? The imprinting, um, I think it goes, bo it, both of those things apply. Initially, when they're really young, there is a lot of contact with me, personally because you have to pick them up, you have to feed them. When they're little, you have to do what mom does. You have to stimulate them to go to the bathroom. You have to toilet them. Um, and this happens numerous times throughout the day. And then you're moving them to clean the cages. So you become mom. You're, I'm a weird mom, but I am mom. I'm doing all the mom duties. Um, and so while they do, I have to say they do imprint on me because they're not aggressive. They allow me to do all the things that their mom would do, and they don't react in a, a wild way, if you will, being aggressive. Um, so I think it is the contact and the association that I am mom. But at a certain point, when you start to distance that relationship, I have had some squirrels throughout the process, not turn, but they wild up a little quicker. I will go in, I go in the cage if I have to clean it with gloves, because I know that we have we have turned, We're the, and they have personalities like people. Some people are warmer and friendlier, and some are not, and they, it's the same thing in the, in the wild world. But the fact that they don't want people coming through and looking at them in cages, or if I, I'm not allowed to bring them out here and have people come and pet them or whatnot, um, because they don't want to get, say, oh, she's, she's good to us, They're, he's good, she's good, everybody's good to us, so people must be good, we won't be afraid of them. And then they'll run into the person that doesn't want them on their property, and we'll shoot them. We have a female raccoon mm -hmm. that comes for dinner every night. Yes. Nine o'clock, nine fifteen, thereabouts. Uh huh. Uh, the house, the, the, the rear wall of the house is an A-frame. Mm -hmm. So it's 
wall-to-wall floor-to-ceiling windows. Mm -hmm. And I built a table out there with a two-by-six plank mm -hmm. with steps on it. And she comes up the ladder and steps off onto the table. And we have a plastic dish screwed down to the table. And that's where we put the dog table and everything. And she's there every single night for dinner. Uh -huh. Two nights ago, she brought three kids. Uh -huh. <laughs> so these, these little things are just adorable. Yes, they are. <laughs> Should, I was going to say, should I give you the fish and wildlife answer or should I give you the Karen Rose answer? I don't have a problem with it. I, um, uh, is she imprinted on you? No. What does she do when you go outside? If you were to go outside while she was there? She's sitting on the table eating. When you'll go outside. And I'm standing right next to the table. She used to run. Okay. And then she went just to the edge of the deck. Uh huh. And now she'll sit there. There's some imprinting that's happened. They, she's associated you with food, right? So you're the person, you're the folks who give her food. And so there is this now, I don't know if you want, there's a trust. And so do I want to, I'll call it an imprint, yes. She is imprinted on you just by the association. And whether it's the Pavlovian dog, like you've rung the bell, the dish is there, it's 9.15, I'm coming to you know, eat, then you know, I would say that there is some imprinting. Fish and Wildlife would tell you their answer is going to be we shouldn't be doing that. Why not? Because of that reason right there. Because we don't want wildlife coming close to our home. We don't want them getting comfortable around us humans and domestic pets. And so that would be. There you go. There you go. That's the whole reason why there. I mean, we've been doing this for years. I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to. I support, I have, you know, I mean, I fill feeders every single day. I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to put peanuts in the feeder for the flyers. I do it, but I support the wildlife that I release. Do they need to be supported for months? Uh, who knows? I don't know. I still do it. Um, but yes, they would say that there's, for, that, for those exact reasons, like the neighbors have a, they might think that your neighbors are good and they may get, go over to the neighbors and say, oh, the food dish was empty when I got here. I'm going to go to the neighbors and then the neighbor's dog comes. So there's the... There's the conundrum. Yes, sir. Um, there's a legality and an illegal process not to be fair to the deer. Correct. So we need to you know, look at that and answer to the question of I think I don't know if you know that, but I know we have a problem and still have a problem in the neighborhood because they are actually feeding the Yes. Yes, that's a that is a big no no. So it's it, it, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the raccoons. I know it wasn't the squirrels years ago or chipmunks or rabbits or anything like that. I think sometimes those those uh, those laws are hard to enforce because they could say oh, I was just leaving it out for the I was leaving this food out for the squirrel. How did I know a bear was coming? So I think some of that stuff can be. We've had a bear. We don't, we like don't, we don't put the food out. Oh, gotcha. I would take all the bird feeders in. Yep. And yep. <laughs> well, I'm way past my time. Anyways. <laughs>